Hi, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Off the Podium. I have a clarinetist with me today. Stephen Williamson is with me. Welcome to the podcast. Very nice to be here, Tigra. Thank you. So what have you been up to recently? That's something I've been asking the guests the past three, four months, no performances or very few performances, if any, virtually. But what, what have you been up to? Uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of practicing involved. Um, but, you know, I think the hardest thing uh, that we've been facing with, uh, with COVID and this pandemic is that we don't really have, uh, it's hard to connect with an audience. Mm -hmm. So even when you do things virtually, I've had master classes and I've done, I've done some online recitals uh, through the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. But, you know, even when you do that, you know, most of the time you'll have an interviewer or somebody will write messages in you occasionally might get somebody who will call in and you'll actually see them on the screen. But you, you know, you're missing that connection. You're missing that, that uh, interaction with an audience. Mm. So that, that's always been really tough. And so I've uh, been, you know, obviously trying to record as much of my own uh, repertoire as possible. Things that you can do by yourself, which is, you know, there are a lot of solo works for clarinet, so I'm lucky that I'm able to practice some of those things, but I'm also practicing concerti, and, and I always keep my orchestral excerpts under my fingers with the, the hope that we're going to be back on stage sometime soon. I mean, there's talk that we're going to try, obviously, like, what Berlin and, and Vienna and some of the orchestras over across the Atlantic are doing which is slowly integrating small chamber ensembles. Hopefully, if we can live stream, we will. I don't think we're, we're at that capacity yet, it, 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 unfortunately, in Chicago, but we'll be recording them for a limited audience, if an audience will be allowed, and then, uh, then re-releasing them. So we'll release those uh, for, for everybody to, to see. And we're hopefully gonna get started on that uh, within a, within the next month or so. Yeah. Quite a few orchestras have, you know, are taking a break, especially the first half of the upcoming season. And uh, I think there are a couple of orchestras that are just not doing the next season. Um, there are lots of negatives, but any positives that will come out of this situation? What do you think? Well, I think the appreciation for the art form itself. Yeah. I think it's amazing what we took for granted. Yeah. And I think because of that, um, the feeling of being able to get together with even the smallest amount of colleagues to make music in any capacity is going to be, uh, it's going to be very emotional. Hmm. You know, music is emotional anyway. I mean, I don't know how it can be. And, and that's what makes it so special is that it's international and everybody can be reached. But I certainly hope that um, I'm going to have a chance, actually to, uh, this Friday, uh, in a couple days, um, I'm going to be doing a television uh, taping at Ravinia at the music festival at Ravinia at Gordon ben Bennett Hall with our concert master Robert Chen and his family, who are there. They make a string quartet. Oh, wow. uh, his wife is a violinist, and daughter uh, Beatrice is a violist who's in her second year at Curtis, and his son Noah is a Well, I don't know what the story is. I, he was at pre-college at Juilliard, and I know his auditions were to be an incoming freshman uh, at Curtis this year, so I don't know what the story is there, but they're clearly super, super talented, and it's exciting because uh, we're going to you know, record a couple movements of the Mozart Quintet, and that will really be the first time that I've been in the same place with anybody other, outside of my family. Hmm. So, yeah, it's going to be neat. Well, since you mentioned Mozart, there's the Mozart Clarinet Concerto. Any composers that you wish wrote for the clarinet that never wrote for the clarinet or didn't write for the clarinet as a, you know, either a solo clarinet piece or a concerto? Any composers that you wish wrote for clarinet? Oh, man. You know, I, I, wish, I wish Stravinsky had written a concerto for the clarinet. I mean, obviously, we have the three pieces and we have his Ebony Concerto, but, you know, I mean, a real actual you know, the classical form of a concerto that, that we know of today. I mean, that's a great question. That's so funny that I haven't thought about that. Yeah, I mean, there are composers alive today that I'm hoping will write one. I'm, I'm 
I'm hoping to reach out to Christopher Theophanides, who I love very much. He was much. recently on my podcast. He was on really? the podcast. Oh, yeah. yeah. We go way back. We used to do a festival down in, um, in Texas, down in Houston, Texas, and, and we would have a traveling band of musicians. My wife and myself had a woodwind quintet that Chris wrote for, and, and I just love his music. I've always loved his music. He's somebody that I'm really hoping when things get up and running at the CSO that um, we might be able to work out a commission and I would love to perform something of his, but he's, uh, he's someone I think about all the time as a, as a modern composer, uh, composers. I mean, you know, I can't complain because look, Brahms wrote the, the two sonatas, the trio, the quintet. He didn't write a concerto, and that would have been great, but I can't complain because, I mean, we get some of the great, as far as wind players are concerned, we really are blessed yeah. with the, the composers that wrote for us, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, I, the two concerti that I'm currently, other than the Mozart, that I'm, well, three, no, two concertos that I'm currently working on, but three, Nielsen, I'm always working on Nielsen, uh, the Corigliano concerto, and... Uh, the Copeland Concerto, because I, I was supposed to, I don't know if it's going to happen, I was supposed to perform that in the first week of November. Um, I mean, the odds are against it. And um, I think what will probably end up happening is it'll just get pushed either to another year or maybe in, in later in the season if, if we're actually back in the hall again. We'll see. Well, you're now at Chicago Symphony. You were met in New York, Phil. Uh, why did you go to Chicago? I mean, sometimes you get used to a place, a city. I mean, especially when you have a family, they get used to that city, that place. Uh, it's kind of comfortable. Why move to Chicago? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, uh, there, there are many reasons, but I mean, the, the toughest transition, of course, is when you have a family. Mm -hmm. and, and all my boys, I have three boys, and they were all born in New York. Mm -hmm. um, I spent most of my life in New York. I mean, uh, a lot of the people that you, you and I know both uh, are from New York and uh, we started our schooling there. I, I think what was tough for me was it started out, when I, when I won the Met, I was done. I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm in the Met Opera Orchestra. I mean, this is insane. Like, I love this orchestra and I love the opera repertoire, and especially for a clarinetist. It's some of the greatest music I think I'll ever play. And I was really, really, really honored and blessed to be a part of that organization. The, the thing that kept happening, and you know, you can't, you can't think about it too much. Because you think about it too much, then the pressure's on, and God knows, probably not going to get anywhere. But the Chicago Symphony had four auditions. And in a span of four years, the first year they asked if I would come. Uh, they, they can invite up to four finalists. And they invited me the first year. And my wife's family's from New York. Uh, and I remember going to her and I said, you know, hey, uh, Chicago Symphony asked if I could come audition for the, the job. And she said, no. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. And she was like, look, I mean, really, we're here. We're settled. We've got our family. This is great. And I said, no, no, it's fine. It's cool. So I called them back and I said, you know, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna stay here at the Met. Um, and that year, actually, I think Ricardo Morales won the audition, but then turned down the job. Didn't within like a few days, he just decided he's gonna stay in Philadelphia. And so then there, the auditions kept going. So the second year they called me again and I said, okay, uh, Jill, I just wanna see, like I just wanna say that I got a chance to play with the Chicago mm -hmm. Symphony. And she said, uh, okay, well, just, you know, you can take the audition, but I, I don't want to move to Chicago. I said, well, I mean, come on. So first of all, I got to win. And that's like a million to one. So I take the audition and it was, it went pretty well, but there was, there was one excerpt that I remember playing that I was like, oh, that's not, that's not even close. That wasn't a good day. And I knew when I walked off the stage that that was not going to happen. So they didn't pick anybody that year. And then they asked me again the third year when I come back. And that's when I said, you know, no, 
I, I talked to my wife and she said, Stephen, come on. You already auditioned. And I said, yeah, I know. I didn't really play my best. And I, I, so I was like, what do you think? She's like, mm-mm. And I said, okay, fine, no. So then I just, I'm done. Okay, I'm not going to do this. I was convinced they would hire somebody and they didn't hire anybody in the third year. So then the fourth year comes around. Sorry if I'm re- repetitive. <laughs> the fourth year comes around and they called me and I don't know what it was, but there was something inside of me that said, you got to at least represent yourself. At least go in there and say, man, I did the best I could and mm-hmm. you know, whatever happens, happens. And I remember asking my wife and she, you know, was, there was a quite a long period of time where there wasn't much talking. And I remember a couple weeks went by and I'm like, you know, Jill, I, I really need to answer these. I really feel like I have to do this. Mm-hmm. And I just want to have a chance. If it goes well, I just want to be, be one of those, you know, that, like they always do. They have like two or three finalists. They get to play a week with the orchestra and then they say, no, none of you are any good and goodbye. And I said, at least I had a chance. I just want to see if I get a chance. Well, I, I went and she actually, she said, okay, fine. She uh, gave me this little rock that says believe on it. And she was so supportive. It was one, she gave me this rock when I won the Met mm. and I kept it in my pocket for over 10 years. Wow. Yeah. And then literally something happened in, in a few months before this audition, I, it, it fell out of my pocket and I couldn't find it. So she went out and found another one that looked just like it and came and gave it to me. She said, look, I support you. Go do your best. And I was really so lucky. I have been extremely lucky for her in my life. And I went out there and uh, it was in the, oh yeah, yeah, this is crazy. It was in the middle of the ring cycle. So we were in the middle of uh, Valkyrie with Levine and they have a procedure out in Chicago. I mean, they have a policy where if you're an invited finalist, you can either show up two weeks before or up to two weeks after the designated final date that they have people who go through preliminary rounds. And, and uh, I couldn't make any of the dates because of my obligations with the Met. And I said, look, I can only come on Saturday, but I have to be back for a 6.30 performance of Valkyrie that day. So I flew in after, I flew in that I flew in that night really late and I basically they put me up in a hotel I I came across the street that next morning I walk into the hall around it was around 11 a.m. when the audition started and I I mean I didn't realize I was the only person there that day. Mm. So there were, everybody else had played I guess that was involved there were maybe nine finalists and I I was the only one that day so I'm like, oh, this is great. I mean, like, if I, I should be able to just, this should be done, and I should be able to get back to the airport. I had a two o'clock, it was like a, no, one o'clock flight. So it was tight. And they informed the committee that he has to be out of the building in time to catch this one o'clock flight, because I didn't want to take any chances. Flying out of Chicago is not an easy thing to do, and and I, I didn't want to throw this at Anthony at the last second. I don't think he would have been available, honestly. So I was worried. But I went in and I played, and um, it went very well. I was very happy with how it went. And I knew at that moment, I'm like, I, okay, I did what I had to do. And I'm, I walk off the stage, and um, I'm going back to the practice or practice room, and I'm packing up my horn, and I'm looking at my watch, and it kind of started a little late, and I'm like, okay, I've got about like, i got about 35 minutes before I need to be in a cab. So I mentioned this, I said, you know, do you know how long the deliberation's gonna take? So I don't know, I mean, uh, let me see. And she said, oh, they, they, they wanna see you right now. The maestro wants to see you. And I'm like, oh God. Okay, so I go into the hall and they had all of the, the members of the jury were just sort of lined along the aisle way on either side. And Muti, maestro Muti, you know, is like right there in the middle. And he's standing there. I mean, I was like, this is weird. I'm not used to this kind of processional type of thing, you know. And I I go up and he says, he has his arms crossed and he's like, so I presume that since you are here, you are interested in the job or the position. And I was like, 
um, yeah, yeah, of course. He goes, because it's yours. And I was like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? And then the crazy thing is he wanted to just like talk with me for a, I mean, he wanted to just get to know me. And I'm like, by that time, I've got like 15 minutes before I got to be in a cab. And I, you know, what do you, how do you end a conversation with like one of the greatest conductors of all time? And I'm, and he's just offered me his very first principal position in the orchestra. He's, you know, I'm the first principal hire that he's had. And I'm just sort of like, and he's asking me, you know, how's Maestro Levine doing? And I say, well, you know, he's had some health issues, but you know, I, I do have a Valkyrie performance this evening. And he's like, oh, that's great. Yeah, not such a fan of Wagner, you know, he starts talking about it. And then he wants to talk to me about the composers he likes. And, and I'm, I mean, I can see his assistant knows, like his assistant is like twiddling her thumbs, like, Ooh. and um, I'm trying to be gracious. And, and I am, I mean, I'm so grateful. And, but the time was crazy. And, and then she said, you know, Maestro, I am so sorry to interrupt, but he has to be in a cab now in order to catch his flight so he doesn't miss the performance tonight. And they said, oh no, it's fine. He was very good and gracious about it, he let me go. Um, I don't, I've never been in a faster cab in my life. I mean, I don't know who they hired, but this guy was going, I, I, I yeah. So end of story, I got on the plane, I flew in, I got to the hall just about an hour before I was, you know, luckily it wasn't so bad. I got to the hall about an hour before, um, and I walk into the pit and I'm warming up. And I mean, tr news travels so fast when these auditions happen. And I already had a note on my stand saying that Maestro Levine would like to see me at the first intermission. <laughs> so, yeah, and this was for an HD taping. So we were under a lot of pressure not to screw up, of course. And I had that in my mind. And then I'm like, I got to meet with him at the same time. So. And a lot happened in one day. And in that same day, I basically went into his dressing room at the first intermission of Valkyrie. And he said, is it true? And I said, yeah, yes, Maestro, it's true. I want the position. And he said, well, I think that's wonderful. He said, I think you're going to love it playing in Chicago. It's one of my favorite orchestras. Said, you know, I want, he said, but if you're interested, I would hope that you would still be considering coming back to the Met. And if you do, we will take you with open arts. We'll, I'll give you a leave of absence for a year if you like. And at that time, I was scheduled to play the Grigliano Concerto with the orchestra in January of the following year. And he said, I really hope that you'll come back to play the Grigliano no matter what. And I said, really, Maestro? I don't want to take advantage of a situation that should be for, what if I don't come back? And he said, well, technically, you're supposed to make your decision by February. So this might be a very nice opportunity for you to reconsider staying in the Met. Um, and unfortunately, he, he had took a big fall in Boston um, and was, he was out with a shoulder injury. So he did not, he was not able to, to conduct the January concert, but Fabio Luisi stepped in, in, the, in place of him. But he didn't know the Corigliano Concerto, and he only had about four weeks, as did I, uh, to change the program. So then they, he asked if I would do the Mozart instead. So I did the Mozart on that program. Mm. That's a crazy day. I mean, one day you can't have this much happen usually in one day. So I was, uh, yeah, I was still spinning. I, I don't remember much of Valkyrie, but I certainly remember those two moments of the day. That's crazy. So your, your wife finds out online. <laughs> oh, no, I called, no, God, I'm sorry. As soon as the maestro told me, as I'm on the way to the cab, I'm on my cell phone immediately to call my wife. Mm -hmm. And before I could even say anything, she said, they offered you the job, didn't they? And I said, what do you mean? I said, I was going to, I mean, I was just hoping to play a week or something. She said, I, I knew you were going to win the job. She said, I knew it because I heard how you were playing before the audition. And I knew, she said, I've always known that you could win this. And I said, well, I didn't know that. And thank you for your belief in me. But so that was tough because we had to then make the decision. Wow. But because I told her, I said, look, I've got a leave of absence. It's not like it's done, like New York is over. Like if we don't like it in Chicago, we can come back. Mm -hmm. 
by the time we went to Chicago, it was a big transition. Obviously, it's, a, it's not New York City. It's a very different lifestyle. And, um, you know, our life is pretty rooted in New York from the moment our children were born. So, you know, it was, the kids adjusted really well, actually. The kids were doing fine. It was more of, of my wife and I, you know, like, is this really where I want to be? I loved my job. I loved playing with the orchestra. And I love Muti very much, and he was very much like a father figure to me. He just basically took me under his wing, and and you know, I mean, it it got to be where if I didn't stop by his dressing room on a on a at least every two or three days, he would come up to me and say, "How come I don't see you that often?" I'm like, "Okay, I'm gonna come stop by," and I learned a lot, and I still learn a lot from him. I think he's just he's an absolute genius. Um, I've been very lucky. Look, I've obviously had James Levine as a music director. I've had Muti as a director. Um, and so the things were going great. And we were finally, Jill had finally, I had literally picked up the phone three times to call the Met and say, I'm coming back. And every time she would hang up on the phone. Oh, wow. She said, look, even though I love New York, and I know you love New York, this is definitely a better job for you. And I had more time with my kids. I wasn't seeing them very all, very much at all when I was at the Met. I'd put them on the bus to go to school. And then I, if I was lucky, I'd get home for just about an hour before, you know, at dinner time, and then I was off mm. to, to the performance. And some days I wouldn't see them at all until the next morning. You know, I, I always made a point to make them breakfast. That's like my thing. I make breakfast for the kids that I have for years and years. And that's when I get a chance to connect but that's how it was then. And now I, I have so much more time. I mean, there are times where I have weeks off because there are no clarinets or there are only two clarinets and it's not a big subscription program, so I don't have to perform it. It gives me an opportunity to be with my children and with my wife. So it was really, uh, as far as uh, family commitment, it was a no-brainer. Wow. Like we, had, we learned so much about how much more we needed each other rather than needing a place, mm. meaning that, well, it didn't matter whether we're here or there, we're all together, and that's really what's most important. And I think, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we, we miss our friends and, and our colleagues that we know in New York very much always have. We stay in touch, but, and, you know, it's not the same. But I have to say that for me on an artistic level, um, things are much more gratifying for me here in Chicago. And to the extent that even when I had won the Philharmonic position and I had a year there, we moved back. I took the whole family because we still owned a house that we were subletting. Uh, we hadn't sold it. Uh, it was a bad time to sell a home. So we were renting it and we basically moved back into our old home again mm. up in Nyack, New York. It's a wonderful city. And so <laughs> that was even the more difficult decision because now I'm in an orchestral job, a symphonic orchestral job. I've got the same amount of time that I had. So what does it matter? Does it matter whether it's New York or Chicago? And now I have the exact same amount of time with my family that I never thought I would have ever in the first place. And then it came down to, well, where do I feel I belong and where do I feel artistically gratified? And it, for me, it, it, it wasn't an easy decision. But for me, the Chicago Symphony with Ricardo Muti just seemed like a, a decision I, 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 I just couldn't turn away from. So. Well, in, in 30 years, when you retire, you could go back to New York. Yeah, right. I think <laughs> this, uh, hopefully, you know, God willing, the city will always be, be there and it is an amazing place to live. And we've talked about that. We've talked about, you know, where would we retire? Mm -hmm. Will I retire? <laughs> I've got I got to put three kids in college. Uh, one of them is a, a sophomore right now, and of all places, he's in New York. He's at Juilliard. He's a horn player, and so we're like, oh, we leave the city, and now he goes there. We don't get to see him as much. And the only silver lining with COVID right now in my in our family is that at least all of my kids are home, and I get to see them. Um, you know, much more than I would have. And uh, that, that's been really nice because I know I feel sorry for people who have 
uh, maybe uh, one child. And, and, you know, within this whole quarantine situation where it's contactless visits and at least my, my children can hug each other and they, they, really, they really didn't realize how much they missed each other and how much they need each other in a time like this. And we all do. We all need each other. So grateful that I have a family big enough that I can, you know, get, get my contact visits in as much as possible on a daily basis. Mm. Well, um, you mentioned your son plays the horn, and in a in, in a past interview, I think it was it was actual um, uh, video interview. I think you said that you wanted to be a brass player. Is that correct? Oh yeah, man, totally. I mean, I I'm one of four boys. I'm the second oldest. My dad's a band director, was a band director, and um, at that and we're all a year and a half apart. I mean, we're really as close as as four children could be, other than being twins, and. My oldest brother picked the trumpet mm -hmm. and, you know, about a year later, I, it was my turn to pick an instrument and I've been playing piano for about four years and <clears throat> my dad said, you know, well, what would you like to play? You know, it's, it was all just before uh, fourth grade. So it was the summer before fourth grade. I was eight. And um, I said, I really want to play the trumpet. And my dad's face just kind of went, mm, really don't think that's a good idea, <coughs> excuse me. And I said, well, well, why? He said, well, you know, you and your brother are just gonna compete with each other all the way through high school and college. And I don't know, I just don't think that that, that would be a good thing. L let's think about another answer. I said, dad, I wanna play jazz. And he said, well, and you know, I said, so I, I guess I'll play the saxophone. And my dad's eye starts twitching. And I'm like, I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, but, I just wanted to play something, you know, I, I can't play the trumpet, at least I can play saxophone, because I know that I've seen that in the jazz ensemble, and I've seen jazz soloists, and even though I always love the trumpet, I mean, it's like my absolute favorite instrument. I, I started to learn Happy Birthday from my uncle, whose birthday was coming up in two weeks. So I picked, my, my dad brought a saxophone home, and I, I, pra I, pra I practiced and practiced, and I learned how to play Happy Birthday, so I get up there, and I was just, I mean, I was, I'm a tiny guy. I'm not very big. Uh, God, I don't even know. I don't think I was, I don't think I ever got past four feet till I was like maybe a just sophomore in high school. I mean, it's like, I'm tiny. So they put, they, 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 he wanted, my uncle's really funny because on my mom's side, my mom's brother wanted me to dress up like some jazz saxophonist, you know. So he, they put a suit coat on me. But the suit coat was so big, they had to put a coat hanger behind my head so that it would hold the shoulders. And then to hide the, the, the coat hanger hook, he put, a, he put a derby on my head. So then I'm playing happy birthday to him like I'm some jazz guru, which of course I'm not. And I get through it. Everybody, yay, great job, Steven. I'm putting my saxophone away. And my dad comes up and he taps me on the shoulder. He says, hey, that was great, son. Really? I mean, that's awesome. You know, I mean, uh, I know you want to play jazz. And he said, you know, the, there's another instrument, but it's, it's a lot harder. And, and maybe, I, you know what, it's, maybe it's too hard for you. So just forget it. Just stay with the saxophone. Of course, he threw out that bait. And I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, it's the clarinet. I said, yeah. He said, have you ever heard of Benny Goodman? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I heard it. Artie Shaw? Yeah, okay. He said, but it's, it's, it's really hard. I mean, like, saxophone's much easier than that. And maybe you should just stick with me. It took you a couple weeks to play Happy Birthday. It was so, gosh, it was so psychological warfare. So I said, no, 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 I want to try, I want to try. Give me, do you have a clarinet? He had one right behind his back. So he pulls it, pulls it right, here. you go, here. The Rubank method and a clarinet. And he said, see you in a couple hours. And I went into my bedroom and I started practicing. And from that moment on, it was over. That was it. I was... I was uh, hooked. <laughs> no, yeah. no doubt about it. We we talked about Benny Goodman when I had Richard Stoltzman on the on the podcast, um, and he didn't believe that I know who Benny Goodman is. Uh, oh come on, uh, Benny Goodman! Uh, I ha and I told him the story. Uh, I I had I got a record, a bunch of records, old records, and I put one on. It's a Mozart clarinet concerto. 
I'm listening to it. I was like, oh, wow, okay. Who, who's this clarinet player? I opened it. It says Benny Goodman. And I didn't even think Benny Goodman played the Mozart clarinet concerto. So it was, it was just... Um, Isn't that cool? Yeah, it was, it was awesome. I have that record. It's, it's pretty cool. I know you said something, uh, especially with the Chicago Symphony, that really is kind of a life-changing moment for you. But any personal life-changing moments? Any, and, and you said that the, the, the moment when you uh, got the clarinet, you played the clarinet, your, you know, your dad. Um, any, any other moments, any life-changing moments that are even bigger that really changed your professional life? And maybe uh, another life-changing moment that's a personal kind of a... Uh, life-changing moment if you don't mind sharing no not at all I mean there there are many I mean it's crazy how many um, for me they're spiritual they're always spiritual so one of them uh, <laughs> one of them was a was my sophomore year sophomore year at Eastman so typically at the Eastman school um, as is the norm they have a rotation system in the ensemble. So if you had an audition, it was like your very first year incoming freshman, you, 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 you played some excerpts and that's it. So really only incoming people or new to the school will, will take an audition so that the conductors can hear the level. And then, and usually uh, studio teachers just then decide the parts, how they'll be divvied up. So all the studio teachers of one instrument get together, they decide how they're going to, you know, give out the parts. But that particular year, something um, extraordinary happened. And, and um, what's his name? Gilbert? Is it Gilbert Kalish? That's, is, or am I confusing that with the pianist? Do you remember that he's the, oh no, Gilbert Kaplan. It's okay. Gilbert Kaplan. Okay. Okay. Sorry, the conductor uh, who did, you know, a Mahler scholar. Mm -hmm. So he decides, uh, Gilbert Kaplan wants to come to the Eastman School and he wants to do Mahler's Second Symphony with the, the Eastman Philharmonia. And at that time, the studios all decided that since it's such a huge opportunity, and because he was going to take the orchestra not only to a couple venues, but eventually to Carnegie Hall. So there were going to be maybe two or three concerts in Pennsylvania and then eventually Carnegie Hall to finish off this incredible opportunity. Mm -hmm. So they ha actually held blind auditions. Mm -hmm. So anybody in the school, whether you were an incoming, you know, an, a freshman or a doctoral student would take the audition. And there were specific excerpts of Mahler, only Mahler's second symphony. So this piece meant so much to me uh, from my earliest memories of putting on records. My dad had two records that were classical. He's a big jazz guy, so he mainly he was a jazz trombone player. So <clears throat> there was a Beethoven's Fifth with Ormandy and the Philadelphia Orchestra, and Bernstein's Second, Mahler's Second, with the New York Philharmonic. So that's the only; those are the only two major orchestral pieces that I even knew of by the time I went to Eastman. I was only a band geek; I only knew band repertoire. And if I knew an orchestral piece, it was a transcription. So I never even learned the right part or even in the right key. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, when they said Mahler's second symphony, my jaw hit the floor and I said, I, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. So I practiced and I practiced and I won that audition. And there were a lot of angry doctoral and master students. They're like, who's this you know, <laughs> kid coming up here, taking over the first clarinet part. And I took it, I, I, we went on tour and we went to Carnegie Hall. And the thing that's so prominent about this particular piece in general is that um, I still, at that time, my freshman and sophomore year, I was still debating whether or not I was going to go into the priesthood. Mm. I come from a very devout Catholic family. And at that time, I still was contemplating uh, going into the seminary. And I was like, this immense, it, it has always been a very uh, important part of my life. I'm not necessarily a practicing Catholic now, oddly, uh, but I am very spiritual. And I feel like it was an amazing moment for me because, I mean, scholars know now that the Mahler Second Symphony, the Resurrection, has really nothing to do with Christ. But for me, it was sort of a... 
a spiritual connection of how can I reach people in a way that I would if I was to go into the priesthood. I can reach people through another language, uh, an international language, a language that doesn't even need words. So what I loved about this was that I knew at the moment from the very first performance, especially the final performance in Carnegie Hall, which was <clears throat> has been recorded, and I, I think they've released it at Eastman, is uh, it's just, you know, and that piece itself, I mean, you can't help but just get caught up in that piece. You are just, by the time the chorus is, is singing at the end, it's just, there's not a dry eye in the yeah. house. Yeah. So I knew at that moment that this was my call. Mm -hmm. it, it was very, very clear to me. I never looked back after that moment. So up until then, I was still debating. Mm -hmm. And I even had started dating my, my girlfriend, who's my wife. Uh, we started when, my freshman year when I was 17. So mm -hmm. she knew how serious I was about the possibility of being a priest. And um, I think everything worked out for the right reasons. I think she's very happy, I'm very happy. We've got three beautiful kids and uh, a very happy life. But that was a monumental moment for me, was wow. just playing Mahler's Second Symphony. Wow. Well, you mentioned jazz and your dad was a jazz player and a fan. Uh, do, you, uh, do you play jazz? And this was so tough because then, you know, he lured me with this thing that, or you can play jazz on the clarinet. And my dad even had jazz band. Uh, you know, he taught the jazz ensemble in the high school. But the crazy thing is, I kept saying, I said, well, dad, if I'm going to play jazz, why can't I just play, you know, just put me in with the saxophone section. I'll just play, I'll play the clarinet part, you know. He said, no, no, it doesn't work in these pieces. And I'm like, but you told me I could play jazz. He said, well, I need a jazz pianist, so can you be my jazz pianist? And I'm like, that's not the same thing. <laughs> and not to mention, I'm horrible. So I remember being petrified. <laughs> I, could, I could imitate <clears throat> and I could copy solos. And one time they took the jazz ensemble down to, um, gosh, uh, Corpus Christi, somewhere down there in Texas, um, uh, for a jazz festival and um <laughs> we played what was it uh spanish steps by chick korea i think and i i knew the solo by heart because that's that's all like i if you put chord changes in front of me forget it no i just i can't do that but i mean it's very bad but then when the jazz solo comes up i can just play this whole solo because i remember it so well and it's, it's just a bunch of fast notes just flying all over the keyboard to the extent where I thought, I'm getting carried away with this. I don't even know if I'm playing anything right. Like, it, nothing felt right. And I remember, like, kind of being really embarrassed because when they were giving out awards at the end of the competition, they gave the best piano solo award to me. I, I, I wanted to give it back because I'm like, Ben, I suck. This is horrible. There's no reason you should even hand this to me. First of all, it's not even my solo. I'm just moving my arms up and down the piano. I don't even know what I'm doing. I mean, I think even my dad laughed about it. He goes, boy, you got away with murder, didn't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I sure did. And so the thing is, I always knew, I, like in my mind, I always knew what I wanted jazz to sound like. Like if I was going to, which is much better. Because for me as a clarinetist, I'm just a single line player. I can think in single line. I cannot necessarily think at harmonic function. Mm. And the keyboard just petrified me. Now, I, I started on it, but as soon as I got the clarinet in my hands, I stopped playing piano. Mm. And then my dad thought, well, you were so good, you could still play the piano, right? It's like, no, man, this is like 10 years later and you want me to play <laughs> piano. I can't even find middle C anymore. <laughs> so, yes. The long story short also is that he didn't, I give him credit for one thing. He did not want me to experiment with jazz uh, because of the, the difficulty in getting a great embouchure on the clarinet, mm. uh, classically speaking. And, and he was right, because I do, even, even when I teach younger students, um, meaning like incoming freshmen uh, in my studio, I, I won't let them play bass clarinet or anything like that, where it does actually change the, the musculature of your oral uh, 
of your orifice to be so for your embouchure. The, the amount of um, the amount of musculature that you need to have a great classical uh, embouchure is, is extreme. And I think most saxophonists just you know, are, are petrified of playing the clarinet. You get few exceptions. You get like somebody like Eddie Daniels, who sounds incredible because he's just, he's just, and, and Larry Combs, my predecessor, the guy can pick up the saxophone and sound like a god. Mm-hmm. He can do it. Um, I just stayed with the, the clarinet family. I never really ventured back to the saxophone. And I do dabble in jazz, but it's, it's, not, it's not worthy of anybody's listening for listening yeah. pleasure. I would say that for sure. Yeah, well, uh, we didn't really, I didn't mention that. I, I want to thank Martin Kuskman for recommending you. It's been a fantastic conversation. And, and I, one thing I want to do one of these days um, is to have both of you on at the same time. Oh, and, yeah, that would be great. It would be I'd great to talk, to talk all kinds of stuff with both of you. And I'm, I'm sure there are lots of stories <laughs> between oh, the two. They're endless. They're endless. Uh, just a quick note, uh, Martin and I are working on a project together. We're, we're, we're in the process of trying to figure out how we can record remotely. If not, it would be ideal to be together in, a, in the same venue. But we're, we're going to be working on some contemporary works together for not just clarinet bassoon, but clarinet bassoon and piano as well. So it should be a, an interesting project. Well, uh, I knew about that project. He told me, ah. I, I, I didn't, he, he told me when I was going to have you on and I didn't know if I should mention that. So I'm glad you did. That's- oh yeah. No, we want to record all this stuff. It's going to be great. I mean, it's fantastic music and, um, very challenging. It's probably the closest thing to jazz that I'll be playing. And, um, so like I say, it's going to take a lot of practice for me to be convincing, but, but he, as Martin has always said, he's like, man, we're going to rock. We're going to rock this. I'm like, yeah, you know what? We've got the soul to do it, and he's inspir- so inspirational to play with. I mean, it's going to be really great. We haven't played in years together, so we're really looking forward to it. Another thing I really I like to ask my guests is something, uh, and you've said so many amazing stories uh, throughout your career and personal life and family, but um, something that your fans, your followers, your students don't know about, your colleagues don't know about, that you do, it's a passion, it's a hobby, whatever it might be, they don't know about, but you're willing to share on the podcast. It doesn't well, even have to be a hobby. It's anyway. No, I mean, they probably know about it. I mean, I, a long time ago, um, gosh, ever since I was a, I would say ever since I was a freshman in, at the Eastman School, a um, good friend of mine is a pianist named Craig Ketter, and uh, he's in New York. Well, uh, when we both met each other, yeah, I didn't know anybody at the school. I really knew, I didn't know a soul. Um, so I was really on my own. And I don't know how we bumped into each other, but I think uh, we were both heading over to the YMCA to get a membership because we were told that that's where you could get your gym membership with a student discount. And it just turns out that he is super, super passionate about weightlifting. And he said, man, I, I, just, I, I just need to find somebody who wants to lift weights. All these musicians here, all they want to do is sit in the practice room all the time. I said, well, I'm not one of them. And I love lifting and let's do it. And we became lifting partners all the way through our four years at Eastman. And we got pretty big. We got very, very strong and very big. And I, it, it, to the extent that I loved it so much that in the summers, <clears throat> I would come back to my home in, in, in Austin, actually in San Marcos, Texas at that time. And um, I needed to earn money uh, to pay for school. So <clears throat> I would... Uh, I would uh, I'd be an assistant in the gym at this unbelievable gym where the, the state's leading power lifters and bodybuilders all worked out. So I learned all these tips from these amazing bodybuilders and, and power lifters and to the extent that when I went to Berlin on my Fulbright after my uh, undergraduate study, so years 91 to 93, it was very expensive and I only had a, a, a living stipendium that was just enough to get by. Uh, so if I wanted to have a gym membership, I had to find money to do that, but I was not allowed to work. So you're not allowed to have an outside income on, as a Fulbright student. So one day I just happened to walk onto the army base, the US military base, which was still there at the time. Even though the wall had come down, some of the bases were still intact and they were phasing out. Well, I walked onto the base and this guy comes up to me out of the blue. I mean, I was pretty big uh, and, he came up to me and said, hey, are you, uh, 
are you a civilian? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a US citizen, but I, I just never been on the base before. I was just gonna come, I don't know, they had a Burger King or something there. I thought I was just gonna stop in and get a burger or something. And the guy said, hey, uh, you, you, you lift weights, right? And I said, yeah. He said, do you power lift? I said, oh yeah, I power lift. And he said, we need somebody on our team. And I said, but well, you're military, right? He said, yeah, but we still need somebody on our team. We can work this out. I said, well, I need a place to lift. He said, well, we got you covered, man. He took me up to the colonel's office. The colonel, you know, I showed him my passport. He asked why I'm there. I said, I'm here on a Fulbright grant. He said, you do what? And I play the clarinet. He goes, you do what? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I play the clarinet. I'm a musician. He said, wow, I, don't, I just can't get my head around this. He said, well, you're in the exact weight class that we need you for a powerlifting team. And our team has been dominating uh, all the other military bases for the last three years. And this is our final year and we want to go out strong. And I said, okay. He said, we'll feed you for free. You can work out for free, but you have to make these meets that we're having. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I said, because honestly, I'm not getting paid. So I'm still not breaking any rules. I'm serving my country, which is kind of weird. It's the only way I ever did. Um, you know, so it was, it was a wild ride yeah. and yes, we did very, very, very well. And it was a, it was a great experience. Cause you know what? I am a big believer in the fact that if you want to be a, uh, a complete individual, meaning a well-balanced person and a musician, it can't just, you can't just do one thing all the time. You have to have balance. Mm -hmm. So for me, one of my best ways to, uh, equalize the stress and the OCD that most musicians have. I mean, we're just so fixated on one thing. I needed balance. So for me, having a physical outlet was so important for me and it gave me, and in a way, yeah, I'm focusing on another one thing, but it helped me balance my life so that, uh, and it actually, for the most part, uh, it kept me very, very healthy. Mm. I didn't have any injuries. Only until lately, uh, I have a shoulder problem from trying to do too much weight too soon, and that's just being stupid. But, but it, it kept my all my tendons and and uh, versatility and, and muscularity and, and and the use of my diaphragm and my air support. It was I strongly recommend it to anybody, you know, any kind of sport. But uh, you know, it's very very healthy for you to healthy mind, healthy body. It's all the same thing. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, young musicians, if they're listening, they, 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 they're taking a lot out of everything you're saying, but any, any other advice you want to give to young musicians, young clarinet players, or just artists in general? Um, yes, two things. Just because you make a good sound doesn't mean it's your best sound. And I think a lot of people get used to hearing the way they sound and then they're complacent mm -hmm. and they just accept it. Well, oh, that's, that's my voice. And my, my personal a uh, challenge for all uh, clarinetists is um, go for the most beautiful sound that you can always get regardless of how technically challenging things are. Because if you truly are using a sense of lyricism in your playing, you can achieve any kind of technical mastery on the clarinet. What it usually means is there's much more um, demand for your air. And most wind players don't even use nearly half the capacity of the air that they're supposed to be using. So it's a combination of most clarinetists don't have enough resistance built into their, um, into their setup because it's harder to play. It means it's more work, more effort on, on the diaphragm. Um, but I'm a firm believer that, you know, without getting a hernia, you should be able to gradually improve the resistance. And if you're recording yourself, with a decent microphone, and you have people listening from a distance, they will hear immediately the, the depth and the multitude of colors that you can get in your sound if you're willing to go the distance. A lot of people just think it's all fingers, light, uh, less is more. And I just don't think the clarinet is like the violin. I just don't think that it's all about, you know, lightness of the bow and the, the freedom of the fingers. There are many clarinets who believe the opposite. And I, 
I, I have great respect for all types of clarinet playing, but for me personally, for those people who are, I think, who want to have a kind of sound that grabs you from the very back of a, you know, 4,000 seat hall, it's this kind of work. Why do we love great singing? I mean, so the other, so that's my thing about just because you make a good sound, it's not your best sound. How do you make the best sound that's with, with, with great air development and strength? and stamina, but I, and it's the embouchure. So for the clarinet, the air and the embouchure are, I mean, everything else comes so much easier if you have this as your foundation. And then I always tell my, my students or my colleagues, anybody, just sing, sing as much as you can. Because if you can sing a phrase, convincingly sing a phrase, then you can actually play that phrase. And you can take it to a whole nother level that most people are not really willing or know. Everybody's capable. It's just people haven't pushed themselves far enough, I think. Wow. So those are my two things. That's amazing. Anything else you want to add before we end today? Just to, just to stay safe. And as hard as it is, the longer that this pandemic goes on, it's very, very difficult for us to try to stay quarantined. <clears throat> I, I don't think it's hard for us to put a mask on. I think that should be a no-brainer. But to, to truly understand that social distancing is, is it's not a punishment. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a necessity and we have to continue to do it, especially in the United States. I, I don't understand why this country itself is, why this is happening. Um, it, it, it's so simple. And yet I think um, we're extraordinarily privileged as a country and I think people don't have the patience yeah. that other countries have been through so much more hardship and understand what real suffering is. I mean, this is nothing, this is nothing to do. And I, I just hope that people will try to <clears throat> step up and do their job as a citizen of the country, as citizens of the world, trying to help others not get infected and stay healthy in so doing. I hope that people will continue to appreciate the arts and be as longing, have a longing for the arts as much as those of us who are artists want to share. Yeah. So uh, it's a two-way street. I can't survive if I don't have an audience, and I hope that the audience feels like they can't survive unless they have the art form. They both need each other. Thank you so much. This was great. And we could keep talking. You have so many great stories. I really hope we could do this again someday. Me too. Me too. It's a pleasure. Tigran, thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. You too. Take care. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.